No my hearty mind. Welcome to the Political Power Hour for another episode. Uh, I am your host Holly Bennett, and I will be taking you through the hot issues in politics today, as well as the fact that I am joined by another living, breathing member of Parliament, but also a leader of a party that we have in Parliament, David Seymour. Welcome. Hey, look, thanks for having me, and um, so good of you to, to name the qualification for being a member of Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I do my best. I do my best. Um, so, of course, as everyone out there will know, today is Waitangi Day, but it doesn't mean that we stop working. Um, we're here in the studio and we have producer Lorchner with us today as well. Kia ora, everyone. Thanks for having me. So he will drop in the conversation as it goes on. It's sort of like the voice of God. It is. David, this is... Yes, Atua. <laughs> That was that was that was real Māori for God. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks for See, the knowledge there. Pertinent on Waitangi Day. If you knew that, you'd probably want to show it off too. <laughs> well, actually, I will just point out. Last week, Lorchner didn't even know what electorate he was in, and he had his MP in here. Oh, really? Yes. And then he goes, "Hey, that's my hood." And then suddenly they had a big conversation, and I just thought, "What's the point in me being here?" I thought you had Simeon Brown on. I did. <laughs> He's an electorate MP. Does he? Oh, oh yeah, but. Well, I, uh, um, we're probably like the only two people that know that. But, um, <laughs> but, 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 are you saying he? Are you saying he was aware of the word hood? Yeah, uh, yes. That's well, I've changed my view of him mildly. Mildly, yeah. he is a millennial. Yes, it's true, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I guess it's just that most most millennials don't start anti-abortion clubs at uni. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> and on to the. <laughs> I just like I just like that's the only thing I know about that guy, and I just think, what's up with him? You know? Do you know what you need to do? Go back and watch um, Switch Aotearoa episode two, Political Power Hour. Right, and you can learn a lot more about Simeon Brown. So Switch Aotearoa. Now, is this one of these? Isn't that like a, a vaping um, product? Well, it would be terrible as a lobbyist. I would be advising not to have this as a vaping product, seeing as where the regulations might go. Okay. Because you know you might lose your business and then have no revenue. Well, obviously we need politicians that stand up for a free society and you know I think vaping is something that is actually worth defending. Is this where you'd like to start off <laughs> today's I, I, episode? I, I, I don't know I mean you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're hosting this thing I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trolling you with random completely irrelevant information <laughs> and you know, I, if I, I feel like you should take control of this interview soon. <laughs> well sometimes it's good to just watch what happens especially when mm. you know it's too extremely outgoing, wonderful, politically motivated people like ourselves together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wow, this is, I like being in this club. <laughs> you're, you're fabulous too. No, thank you. So everyone, same format as we run every week. We're going to, um, we're, I'm going to introduce David and talk a little bit about him. And then um, we will go into the top five political stories of this week in politics. And... Um, glean a lot of David's views on them. Then uh, we will head on to um, just a little discussion about some of the things that he's got going on, including what's happening for him in election 2020. Um, and then, of course, we'll get him to write his note for next week's member, that, or next week's guest that's going to be joining us. So on that note, what we do every week, David, is we get our guest to write a note for the next guest. Right. So Simeon has written you a note. Yeah. 
But you've only had one week, so can that really be a pattern? Yes, of course okay, I can. Sure. All right. So, so, right, so you, you have to, to open that. I see. So you so want so me to read this? The, yes. It, no, yeah. you're going to read it. It's right. your note. Yeah. But you're going to read it live. Okay. I told did him to he, not put any swear words in it so that we did can. He, did he write it himself, do you reckon? Yeah, yes, of course he did. I sat oh, here right. and watched it. Dear David, please win Epsom. Simeon. Oh, the well, that's <laughs> bizarre, but thank you. Why is that bizarre? Well. T- talk me through, as a member of parliament, another yeah. member of parliament telling you to win Epsom. Why is that, why is that bizarre? Well, just to think of all the things he said to, to say to me. I mean, it's sort of a given that you're, you're trying to be re-elected um, to Parliament. Um, but I guess maybe it, I shouldn't say it's so bizarre, maybe it reveals that, you know, he, like many people in the National Party, recognise that um, without ACT, they are completely part one, partnerless. Mm-hmm. Um, and ACT's pathway to Parliament um, is to win the Epsom electorate for the sixth time uh, in a row, which sounds like it might be um, relatively easy, mm-hmm. but the truth is that electorates belong to voters. Mm. People underestimate this. So people see on the news, mm. there's politician here and politician here, and it's like two puppets. And real politics is about people. It's actually about going to the door, understanding the person's concerns, and then relating to them that you can solve their problem. Yep. Assuming you genuinely can. Yep. Um, you know, if someone sort of says, look, I, I need you to ban 5G and, you know, um, <laughs> get rid of all the aliens, then, then often I can't deliver. Um, Why not? Well, because those things aren't real. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, um, but, but, you know, assuming that you actually can address people's concerns, then, um, then, then you, I think, you know, you've got to demonstrate that you can do that. And it's a human decision one at a time. Um, so that's what, that's what elections should be about. So you've been the electorate MP for Epsom since 2014, is that That's right, yeah. And um, prior to that, what were you doing before you entered Parliament? So I'm a recovering electrical engineer. Um, Recovering? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I did a a BE in electrical and electronic, and I did that for a relatively short time, actually. Yeah. And by that time, I had the bug. I was interested in... um, public policy and economics and philosophy. Yep. I also did a philosophy degree, so I did a BA, BE. Um, not so I could get those letters, but but that's for the, the two degrees I did. Yep. Um, and um, I basically just thought, well, look, I can could be an engineer. I'm not terrible at it, uh, but I just got the bug. I was fascinated by politics, fascinated by economics. I was fascinated by why so often uh, societies choose just really dumb policies. Mm. And how you know often everyone can see it's dumb, but it's hard to bring people together and lead you back to a, a better situation. So um, that fascinated me. I went off and worked for a, a public policy think tank, a private sector think tank, I might add, okay. um, in a city called Regina, um, which is the capital of Saskatchewan, which is a province in Western Canada. Mm-hmm. I hadn't heard of it either till I got a plane <laughs> ticket. They gave me a job, and it was was fascinating. It was like doing a second degree because I got to l- read a lot of the economics. I got to learn how to deal with the press and difficult interviewers. Mm. Um, you know, I got to um, you know, basically you know research different problems that they had um, with their policies up there, yeah. um, and, the, and it was like almost doing a, a second degree, and and it was a good preparation for um, you know trying to be an effective MP. So going back to something that you just said. Um, which I think is very, very important uh, to wind back the conversation to this, um, is talking about dumb policy. Hmm. What is one of the dumbest policies that you have ever seen that's been implemented? Hmm. Um, look, Kiwi Build is a really dumb policy. Um, okay. And, you know, I know that you know it's become a byword for failure and everyone's blah, 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 didn't keep their promise and, and all the rest. Um, and look, it is a failure, and the government has effectively cancelled it um, and, and, and gone backwards, which is all true. Um, but you know, the reason it's a dumb policy is that it never identified the correct problem. Okay. And if you don't define the problem, you can't solve it. Right. Uh, so you know, the problem with with housing, there is a problem with housing. It's basically that the cost of a section in Auckland has gone up uh, by about nine hundred percent. In 25 years, right, uh, and that's outrageous. 
I mean, Apple stocks haven't gone up much more than that. And Apple, like, revolutionized the music industry, sold us both our laptops and our phones, yep. um, invented the iPad and did a whole lot of other things in that period. Mm -hmm. uh, Auckland sections have gone up almost as much as Apple shares. Yep. Um, why? Basically because uh, the rules and regulations from the... Um, uh, the rules and regulations from the council make it really hard to build outside a restricted area, mm. so it's got a shortage of land. Mm. And the funding of the infrastructure means even if the councils won't w let you build there, there wouldn't be any infrastructure, no, no pipes, no roads, nothing to get to it. Um, that's the real problem. Okay. Until you free up more land and you get more affordable sections to build the houses on, um, there's no point in the government effectively employing builders to build houses because they're just competing with all the private sector builders for the same limited number of sections, which is the real problem. Right. So unbelievably dumb. Really big problem. The problem that this government was really elected to to, to solve, in my view, I think that's the thing that tipped it over the line for them in, in, in 2017. Um, and by failing to define what the real problem was, uh, they came up with a solution that's completely ineffective and mm. and. In a way, it's it's just justice that they were politically embarrassed for doing it. Oh, really? Is that yeah. how you honestly view that? Why would I lie to you, Holly? <laughs> Good. I'm just making sure. <laughs> Keep you on your toes. I mean, well, I'll give you a totally different answer. It's the real one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... If we uh, think about good policy, hmm. one policy that you've had a hand in creating, which yeah. I would say is viewed as an extremely effective and robust piece hmm. of policy work is charter schools. Hmm. Um, we know that that was taken apart hmm. in uh, end of 2017, early hmm. 2018, when the government came in. Um, would... What's the next steps there? Because I do know there's a lot of people out there that would love to see those reinstated. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, thank you. And I, I'm, I'm so proud of charter schools. I mean, lots of things go up and down in politics, but I'll always be proud of what we did with charter schools. Mm. And again, the, the, what's the fundamental problem? Well, the fundamental problem is there's a lot of kids out there disengaged mm. and we don't know how to engage mm. them. Um, as it turns out, there are people in the community who know how to engage those kids. Let me just give you an example. Ronnie Raquel, I'm sure she won't mind you mentioning her name, or me mentioning her name. So Ronnie runs a civil construction firm in Hawke's Bay. Yep. Um, she is one of those force of nature people that you occasionally meet. Yep. She's been taking on apprentices, mm -hmm. getting kids off the street. She says things like, gee, they should give me an award for the amount of burglaries I, s I stopped by <laughs> getting these kids off the street. Um, well, she said, look, I'm sick of this. The kids get failed by the education system. They're on the street. Then I try and fix them up when they're 17 or 18. I want to start a school and get to them earlier. Yeah. So she did. And she's the kind of person you don't say no to. It's the kind of person that draws people's respect. So they started off with 18 kids. Yeah. And... Um, Anyway, about six weeks into the school opening, they got a call from Oranga Tamariki, which I think at that point was called SIFS, mm. said, we got this list of 18 kids that have gone missing. They said, yeah, they've been coming to school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's the kind of... So, so we brought people... We, we, the problem was we didn't know how to engage kids and we brought people that could engage them. Mm. Um, look, I think now it's, it's tricky because the simple thing to do is win the election, which yep. I'm pretty focused on this year. And then we say to the National Party, if you want to be in government with us, then you know, you've know you got to um, re-legislate charter schools. Yep. Now, that shouldn't be too difficult. Yep. This is the National Party <laughs> already claiming <laughs> that this is the best idea they ever had. Yep. Um, so you know they, they say there's no limit to what you can achieve if you don't care who takes the credit. Yep. The difficulty is that we've seen the way the political dynamics work. Yep. Um, people in government and in positions of power don't seem to care much about the kids. They closed these schools mm -hmm. that were helping mostly poorer, browner kids because the teacher unions that are mostly middle and upper middle class white teachers didn't like it. Now, if that's not a failure uh, of good policy and, frankly, moral leadership, I don't know what is, and what the hell kind of value maori has got out of electing 13 Maori MPs, I have no idea. Because, uh, you know, it, when it comes to the government, those Maori MPs are missing in action. Um, 
So that was a real shame. And unfortunately, one of the things it does is it means it's going to be difficult to persuade people to start new charter schools, even if we win the election and legislate that they can. Mm. So we actually need to take it further and make it bigger. And here's a few ideas. One is that we let state schools convert to charter school status. Yep. They control their funding. They control their management structure. They don't have to pay union rates. They can pay teachers on whatever kind of contract they like, just like the rest of the economy. Yep. Um, so that creates a bigger armada, if you like, yep. of schools that are invested in the model. But here's the other alternative, which I think is worth doing, is that we basically go ahead and say, okay, uh, we spend a quarter of a million dollars on every kid's education. $15 billion a year, 60,000 kids born every year, 250 grand each. Okay. Um, here's what we do. We are going to take uh, that 250 grand, and for when your kid turns two, we're going to put 12 grand a year until they turn 18. That's $184,000. Then we're going to give you 30 grand. And uh, if you do really well, actually we'll give you a bursary so you get 70 grand that you can use for the university or being a lifelong learner. Yep. That doesn't quite give you the 250 on average, but of course there's some administration. We're not going to fire all of the Ministry of Education bureaucrats, just most of them. Um, and well, seriously, I mean, there's more education bureaucrats in this country than schools, and they get paid more than the teachers, and it's a disgrace. Anyway, we fire most of them. Um, <laughs> they free up a lot of money for educating kids. <laughs> Um, well. I was in charge of them. I couldn't work out what they were doing. So, <laughs> look, and I did actually try. Um, second of all, um, you know, it allows people to be lifelong learners. So yep. we're talking about a revolution where we say education's for the students, yep. not the teachers. Yep. The money goes to the students. If the teachers want the money, they've got to put up a proposition the kids want. Yep. If the kids don't choose it, they don't get the money. And that would mean that you could take your money to a public school or a private school or a charter school and the amount of choice mm. and control mm. uh, that parents would have, the amount of competition and entrepreneurship on the supply side uh, would be a revolution engage so many more of those kids. So your question was what happens with charter schools? Um, they're coming back inevitably. Is that a non-negotiable for you? Yep, no matter who's in power. And I'll tell you why. Because politicians can stop a school, but they can't stop an idea. Yep. And that basic idea that there's people out there in the community who know more about how to engage our kids than, um, you, you know, the, than the people in the restricted to the current system, uh, is is unstoppable. Mm. And sooner or later, charter schools become a normal idea. It's happening all over the world. Fascinating. You said during what was a very articulate um, way of describing what is, mm. uh, what I as I said, a, a great policy which I think has been unfortunately stripped away. Um, about you talked about um, Maori MPs and um, how I think we have more Maori MPs now in Parliament than we've ever had. Mm. Um, you're Maori yourself, yep. Ngāpui. That's right. Um, what does Waitangi Day, because it is Waitangi Day today, what does it mean to you? Well, it's it's a unique, and that's an overused word. When I say it's unique, I mean it is the only one of its kind mm. uh, ceremony mm. and celebration in the world. And it's a combination of commemoration and conversation, which recognises that while we've achieved incredible things, mm. taking the two totally different people, literally from like the furthest apart two countries on earth, yeah. have come together and have an ongoing conversation to live together. And that's yeah. why Waitangi Day can be a nice celebration. Often it's a bit rancorous, sometimes it's a bit petulant. Um, but it's unique. I don't think anyone else has a national day where they simultaneously celebrate and converse and make progress year after year after year. So it's something I'm very proud of. How do you feel the progress is going for Napui and settling? Well, <laughs> look, it's, it, it's very difficult and very complex. Um, and the, the complexity of it... Uh, comes from the fact that the, 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 the iwi concept doesn't really work in Northland. Mm. There are so many different hapu who all have overlapping claims. Yeah. It's difficult to even work out how to negotiate with. So the last hui that I went to up at Waitangi yeah. was about a year ago. Mm. Actually, it would have been less than that because it was since last Waitangi day. Um, and a couple of hapu were sitting 
symbolically off to the side at 90 degrees from everyone else because yep. they refuse to be part of the conversation. Okay. So you've got people debating even the legitimacy of who you're negotiating with. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a really big problem, and I don't see it being resolved in the near future because the current leadership is so poor. Right. So you know the average age of Napoli is 22.4 years old. Mm-hmm. Last thing I went to there, I was the youngest person by about a decade. <laughs> I'm 36. So young people have lost all faith. Right. Leadership is not working. Right. Um, and uh, the the compl- underlying complexity of the problem makes it hard anyway. So much so that really. You know, you've got 120,000 people. If they could just get their proverbial together, the crown would give them five billion bucks. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, how hard should it be? Yeah. Um, but, of course, you know, there's, there's just there's, there's real barriers and there's personality barriers to making it happen. Ten million dollars is the cost to the crown in the past ten years, I think it's been, for um, trying to progress this, mm. this matter. Um, as someone who is Ngāpui... Mm. Um, and you touched on the thing about Kiwi Build. The reason why it didn't get off the ground is because they failed to identify the problem. Mm. Why don't you, you, you yourself, you know, mm. with this insight, mm. use that with your whānau? Um, a couple of reasons. One is that my connection is very real to me, but it's not an everyday part of my life. Correct. Yep. So. It's a little bit like I also know I'm part Scottish, but I'm not trying to solve their problems. Yeah. Um, second of all, um, I think it, it actually is something that you could devote your life to as a professional. If mm-hmm. you were going to do it justice, you would have to devote you know, a decade of your life. And uh, given some of the other commitments I've got, I'm in no position to do that. <laughs> yeah, just a, couple of, just a couple of commitments, just a couple of them. Um, so you currently live in central Auckland, is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, I live in Epsom, um, but but yes, that's relatively central. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, your act party profile says that you live in Central Auckland. That's why I found that found that interesting. Oh, okay. Well, I certainly don't live in Auckland Central. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. I thought, I'm sure he lives in his electorate. Yeah. Well, I think to to, to a lot of people, you know, any, anyone, any anywhere in that sort of five k from the Sky Tower area, I mean, is very central compared yeah. with. You know, you've got to remember Auckland extends 20 k's in every direction, yeah. so, yeah. Well, Tamaki's my electorate, so, oh. like, you know, just next next door, so. Well, is it really? Well, I, it was. I, that was the electorate that I grew up in. So. I, I would have thought, uh, but you must be down, down south now, aren't you? I am. I'm yep. in Kirikiriroa, so I'm in Hamilton, but right. that is my home electorate in terms of, like, where I grew up, where yep. I have connections to. Um, so not an Epsomite, Epsonite, Epsonite. I don't e- Epsomite. <laughs> Sounds like a spread, doesn't it? <laughs> No comment. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, um, David, I've got a question for you. Oh, uh, yeah, far away. Go awesome. Um, so it's cool that uh, fa- just finding out that you're an electrical engineer, you have a background in that. Um, I do too. Yeah. Um, so as an electrical engineer, or actually not electrical for me, I did computer systems. Look, I, I can't tell you how to get laid, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think uh, us engineers are in a position to do that. No. <laughs> jokes um <laughs> no my question keep going, was, Lushna, come on keep going. all right all right <laughs> power through all right let me let me tr- okay here, here we go um as a person with a background in technology do, you, do has that influenced how you view your approach to policy in terms of problem solving yeah well, i think you, you just took the words out of my mouth it's about problem solving so as engineers um we understand there are people that have problems in the world and we seek to design solutions for them um, and of course you know we have a design process um, that we use which of course starts with the, the problem definition and generating alternative uh, solutions and comparing them and doing cost-benefit analysis and ultimately coming up with the best solution that's how I think you should do policy making um, but of course um, most people uh, are not engineers um, most people prefer to have social lives um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> So they don't think that way, and I think it's a great shame because I do think that the, you know, the design process that works in the physical world means that you know things like laptops and microphones actually work uh, has a lot to offer the policy design process when it comes to doing things like working out how to build more houses more affordably. Can we just, on that note, take stock of your laptop right now? I was yeah. just having a look at it as you were speaking, yeah. given what Lorchner raised about, yeah. you know, it's a bit um, rugged. 
Pakaru, yeah. Well, so um, <laughs> I was. Um, what actually happened is that, um, like, lime scooters don't have um, any kind of carrying tray. <laughs> this was before they were banned when they were legal, obviously. So I was like riding along with my laptop stuffed in my pants, and uh, <laughs> anyway, it came out. You no no hold on, you were not riding a lime scooter with your laptop. Yeah. In your pants. Yeah. No. Why not? Where would you put it? Well, one, I wouldn't ride a lime scooter because well, well, I'm ex- just would you just walk and be late? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that okay. you would, yes. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Well, I mean, you know, this is why we believe in freedom and choice. Well, I chose. <laughs> I, I chose to, to stuff a sort of wedge it in my belt and um So the leader of the Axe Party just Hey mate well, yeah, I'm a human and um <laughs> uh and uh I, as it turned out I total, I wiped out pretty spectacularly. Um yeah, so anyway that 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 did some damage to my laptop but it still works and um obviously it's government property so I wouldn't replace it unnecessarily. I like that approach to things. That's very good. Fiscally All right. conservative. Yeah, there we go. On yeah. my IT budget. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not sure that there's probably much money left to get you a new laptop anyway. So. Well, is that because just under spent it all? Just with the rate of spending, you know, pre tertiary yeah. education and things like that. Well, it is. I think it is really interesting to look at the economic and fiscal up- updates. Um, I don't know how many people want to join me in being interested about this, but. <laughs> Um, let's I won't. Go. I won't be. So you know, I might just leave for the <laughs> and let you run the show by yourself. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. Come on. You know, one of the legacies of Ruth Richardson yeah. is the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and I really admire Ruth um, right. for quite a few reasons. But one is that she she left a law that said that before every election um, and every budget, and for some reason also every December, uh, the government must publish full fiscal statements, accrual accounting, so you can see if the government actually is going to run a deficit or if uh, it's, you know spending beyond their means or whatever. Because prior to that, politicians used to just lie all the way up to the election and then open the books and discover that actually they were broke, but you'd already elected <laughs> them, so it's too late. <laughs> so that's Ruth's legacy. Um, and it means that you know three times a year, twice a year, sometimes three times a year, uh, the the, the Treasury produces a set of accounts for New Zealand and they do forecasts four years ahead. So that means that they forecast the year 2020 like, you know, four times. In 2017, they forecast that spending would be about a hundred and, uh, sorry, 96 billion this year. Mm. Uh, spending is now forecast to be 104 billion. Okay. So that's the Treasury's forecast for the year 2020. And, and it's the same, forecasting for the same year, what's changed in that time is that they've had three years of working with the current government and they've said, whoa, you guys are going to spend a lot more in, on the same stuff in that year than we thought anyone would three years ago. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's true. You've basically got $8 billion of additional spending. You've mm-hmm. gone from a forecast uh, $7 billion surplus to a forecast $1 billion deficit. Uh, just in the last two and a half to three years of this government, um, and that is burning up a lot of cash, and of course that puts pressure on other parts of the economy. You know, it, it has to come from somewhere. Either they raise taxes, they borrow it, or uh, they spend less elsewhere. Yeah. No. What 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 would be the biggest thing that you'd change? In terms of expenditure. Yes. Look, I think the biggest thing is that we actually need to look into the future and confront our challenges in relation to uh, superannuation. You know, we're, we're going to a world where People will spend 27% of their life, on average, on super. Because, you know, you keep giving it to 65, and people are going to be living longer and longer. Mm. Uh, so more than a quarter of their life receiving super paid for by the taxpayers. We're going to go from having five taxpayers um, supporting uh, every super annuitant to two taxpayers supporting every super annuitant. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's just not sustainable. Yeah, no. um, so that needs to change. And the funny thing is... The earlier you start, the easier it is because mm. you can change it a little bit every year. So, you know, next year it'll be 65 in one month and the year after they'll be 65 in two months. You know, by 2032, say, it might be, um, might be 67. Um, and people can adjust to that change. Um, but the alternative is we actually go broke, have a big political dust-up and then have radical changes, which is what happened in the early 90s. So, you know, that, that's, that's a big thing that could be changed, but there's a whole lot of stuff. I mean, the fees-free has clearly been a policy failure. It's mm. mostly gone to decile 10 kids who are going to university anyway and are getting a discount. Well, 
that's not a good use of taxpayer money on an efficiency ground, on a moral ground. Uh, it is a policy failure. Um, and I just simply look at the Provincial Growth Fund. Uh, overwhelmingly, that is a slush fund to try and help get New Zealand first re-elected again. That's not a good basis for public policy. And so it goes on. Don't you think, though, perhaps with the, if you look at the Provincial Growth Fund, it is a way, though, that has really started to um, think about there is a wider story to be told outside of Auckland, and that's not a bad thing? Well, <laughs> I think it costs a billion dollars to tell people there's places outside Auckland. Oh, well, I think if I look at in terms of what mm. I do for a day-to-day -day mm. and having to try to engage with some of these heaving government departments, mm. you go through what their consultation looks like. They are often never travelling to Waikato. They're never travelling out anywhere outside Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. And some would argue, um, and, you know, having lived in Hamilton now for two, two and a half years, um, it is actually a good thing to have people's minds trained on places outside the big three. But is it, is it necessary to spend the money to do that? Or um, does a government just need to come in and say, by the way, folks, uh, when you do your procurement, you know, you have to have regard to, uh, you know, places other than Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. Uh, when you consider, you know, locating personnel, you've got to consider you might actually be able to deliver better services for cheaper by locating your staff in other housing markets. I mean, there's, you know, there's lots of things that that government could do mm. um, that I agree with. Not sure why you need to spend a billion dollars a year on it, though. Yeah, sure. Uh, one thing I would say is that you know, <laughs> humans are inherently selfish people. So the one thing it has done is it's it's put that incentive out there for people mm. to think outside the box and, and make applications. Whether or not they go anywhere is another, you know, another matter. Um, but I, I do just think um, that regional element of um, what the government's doing is a good thing. For you, as with just one MP in Parliament, mm. what do you want to see happen? Do you want to get more MPs elected and therefore have you know, greater coverage across the country? Mm. What are you trying to do? Yeah, so, so first of all, that's, that's a reality, um, depending on which poll you look at. Um, you know, more party votes mean more ACT MPs. Yep. Some polls saying two of us, some polls saying three, some even saying four. Yep. Um, so we're really happy about that. Yep. Um, and of course, my goal is to build up a party that stands for people's basic rights and freedoms yep. and advances policies that actually make a difference, yep. like charter schools, yep. like assisted dying. Um, and I want to be able to leave that party as a going concern, ultimately with you know anywhere from six to ten MPs. Mm. It's consistently over the five percent threshold, um, even though we don't need to break five if we get you know Epsom, then we we get extra MPs just for the party votes we get. Um, yeah, we'll see. That's you know my <laughs> mate, um, and um, you know that the um, I guess the 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 main thing that I'd say is that. You know that, that this election is the opportunity for us to pick up, um, you know, anywhere from one to five extra MPs. Yep. Start building a caucus culture. Start having more people located in different parts of the country, yep. um, and and start building that that going concern of a party that represents those New Zealanders who care about those core rights and freedoms. Going concern. It sounds like a business. Uh, well, you know, I think we should all be thinking about business, and we should all be thinking. Uh, you know, like business people when it comes to building projects like this. Yeah, absolutely. So what's your party list looking like? Has it been announced for 2020? No, Holly, and there's still opportunity <laughs> there. So, you know. No, no, I'm happy and the happy as Larry in the private sector, thank you. Yeah, well, that, that's, <laughs> that's the funny thing, right? Like, if you had died on the wall commie, you'd probably want to stand, but not for us. So, um, <laughs> you know, our people tend to be out there. Um, you know, actually making a difference in the world and building homes, families and businesses. The um, last thing they want to do is go into politics. On the other hand, if you think that the world is made a better place by politicians and their grand government schemes, mm. uh, then, <laughs> of course, you, you do want to go into politics. So there's a natural challenge there. In spite of that, mm. we've got some fantastic people. You look at Beth Holbrook, our deputy leader. You know, she's an award-winning businesswoman. She's a former um, sheep and beef farmer. She's a mother of two. She's been elected as the chair the Rodney Local Board, I mean, she'd be a better MP than 90% of my colleagues on her first day. When you say colleagues, are you talking about members of parliament yeah. or act members of parliament? Well, I, I, you know, the, ans <laughs> the, answer, the answer to that is so obvious that to ask it is just rude. Well, some, some, <laughs> is it rude? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you have to lead people down these paths. 
<laughs> yeah, if you're if you're a rude person. But, uh, anyway, so ob- obvi- obviously I must mean other colleagues and, and uh, uh, colleagues from other parties in Parliament. But um, you know, Beth is a really good example of someone like that. You look at Brooke Van Velden and what she's achieved. Um, usually, parliamentary staffers only get in the paper if they've done something very naughty. Yeah. Um, the Sunday started a two-page spread on Brooke's contribution to the End of Life Choice Act passing yeah. um, as a parliamentary staffer. Yeah. Phenomenal. But that's the effectiveness and the influence that she had within the parliamentary precinct as a staffer. Um, so look, she's, I think, keen to stand, and I think she would be an incredibly effective MP. Oh, absolutely. She is someone that I did want to mention because... I've had her at an event in Waikato oh, yeah. and um, we had it at the university and she spoke on behalf of ACT and a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said, oh, I didn't necessarily think ACT was going to be the place for me, mm. but listening to ways she, that she spoke about things and mm. she rationalised it and ran through it um, mm. completely changed their you know, view on the party. Mm. Um, so, I mean... Is that something that you're looking to attract more maybe younger people to the party? And Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things Brooke does because, I mean, she's like late 20s. Um, I think that she brings more uh, people in, in that age group for sure. Um, but I also think that young people have more to gain from X approach. I mean, a lot of our staff, education, productivity, growth, housing, I mean, you know, th- these are issues, you know, sustainability is super, I mean, these are issues that matter more to you the younger you are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, X policy is often a bit more complex than the slogans you get from other parties. Um, X policy is often, you know, long-term gain, short-term complexity. Yeah. Uh, you know, but uh, if you're a younger person, then that's actually the right place for you to invest. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to um, move on to the next part, right. which is, is talking. That, yeah, how long have we got? We've, the, we've oh. just got, we've got another 20 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah, this so is flying by. <laughs> Um, and so what we're going to do is just talk about the five top um, topics in politics in okay. New Zealand. Um, I'm going to just rattle them off first, yep. and then I just want to get some okay, of so your you short answers. Oh, no, I'm just going to touch <laughs> on them. <and laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I <laughs> no, got message received. Yeah, I understand. No! <laughs> so um, the top stories in politics um, for this week is obviously Waitangi Day, um, President Trump mm. being acquitted on both mm. impeachment charges, mm. um, coronavirus. Mm ongoing issue, um, flooding in New Zealand and Gore, yep. and also um, ACT Party Leader State of the Nation Address, mm, very exciting. which happened today. Mm. So um, we we mentioned, you mentioned earlier about what it means to you and, um, you know, uh, Waitangi Day mm. as someone, um, you know, that is of Māori heritage. Uh, In 2016, I was reading a Sunday Star Times piece that you did where you talked about um, Waitangi Day being not just about those in Waitangi and Mm. perhaps it should turn into sort of... Mm. I I don't like to use this word roadshow because I don't want to make it something that's like, you know, we're going out there and trying Mm. to sell it to the Mm. people. But do you still stand by that? Because as an idea, I think it... Well, you know, I'm from Te Arua, so Rotorua. So it makes sense. Well, first of all, I mean, it would be more historically accurate um, because people think about th- the Treaty of Waitangi, but actually it did go on tour. I mean, it was signed, and actually there were multiple documents too, which I think caused some of the trouble, but um, it was signed in a variety of locations over yeah. several months up and down the country. And wouldn't it be cool if each year the treaty went to a new one of those locations? Yeah. Imagine what that would, would teach people um, and how much people could learn about the, the history of it, which I have to say I don't know much about where it went. I just know it went to quite a few places. Mm. Um, but second of all, and when I wrote that at the time, we're having huge difficulties, as usual, at the Titi, Lower Marae, and um, Waitangi. And the thought was, well, you know, if you moved it to a different site each time, um, I think there would be an incentive to put on the best show. Mm. Whereas if you know that the politicians have to come back to you every year the incentive is almost to put on the worst show and that's what was happening for a long time funnily enough the problem has kind of been solved the way I described um, because they did move it away from the lower marae and up to the upper marae on the treaty grounds so um, what I sort of called for has kind of happened halfway Mm. and I think we have had better years in in Waitangi over the last couple of years um, as a result I can tell you Te Arawa would put on a great show at Ohinamutu? I have no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. You could lead it. 
probably not the cuppers. I'm not very good at kabaka. I'll but. take your word for it. <laughs> okay, story number two, President Trump. What do you make of all of this stuff happening in America, especially given you were just mm. there? Well, I, I was. I was driving across the US and listening to the Senate impeachment trial on the radio, and it, it's a really sad thing for America. Um, you know, the Founding Fathers, they um, had, in many cases, been to pre-revolutionary France. Mm-hmm. They'd fought the English monarchs. Um, they'd studied the ancient uh, Greek political philosophers, Plato and, Ath- and uh, Socrates and Ath- Aristotle and all those guys, um, Pericles. And um, they were trying to design an institution and, and, and a constitution um, that would be immune to the tyranny of the mob uh, the tyranny of um, you know the, the dictator yep. um, and the tyranny of the guillotine as well in the French um, and um, what I saw in this impeachment trial was not dissimilar to the court case that awarded effectively awarded the presidency to Bush back in 2000 um, it was a decision that in theory was made on a set of legal principles um, about what impeachment is and so on in practice, almost nobody voted outside of partisan lines. So yep. it was predetermined by which party was in control. Um, and interestingly, with that court case, people have shown they could predict the result just by um, which party the judges were appointed by back in 2000. So um, it's really sad that, that the institutions that were designed by the founders um, aren't really doing anything to stop mob rule and effectively popularity contests instead of principles. Now, yeah. that, that, that argument works whether you're a Trump supporter or not, by the way. I mean, if you're a Trump supporter, you think, well, you know, um, the whole thing was just a massive beat-up and should never have even brought... There should never even been impeachment trial brought to the House. Um, if you are a Democrat... Um, then you think, well, you know, bringing the prosecution was the right thing to do, but of course, um, you know, that the Senate didn't act as impartial jurors. So either way, it's, it's a, it is a really sad time for American democracy. Um, issue number three, mm. coronavirus. Mm. So when we had our show this time last week, uh, there wasn't the call for it to, you know, the World Health Organization saying mm. it was, a, a, you know, as big as it is, mm. is now. Um, what... What imp- how do you think New Zealand's responding to this? And also, what do you think are the wider implications um, for how we have responded? Well, when you say we, I, I'd sort of like to talk about the New Zealand government, uh, the people that have been you know, put in place of responsibility for taking action. Yeah. I think you'll say they've been hopeless. I mean, I'm no virus expert, but here's a few basic facts for dealing with crises. Number one, you need to work out what information you need. Uh, do you have it? And if not, when will you be able to get it? Yeah. Um, at the time that they started making decisions, uh, we didn't know much about the virus. It hadn't been through many incubation cycles. It was difficult to know how its transmissivity. It was difficult to know its lethality. Uh, so it was difficult to make decisions. Um, number two principle, given the uncertainty, and given it might be some time till you have the information you need, it's better to start off conservative mm. um, and then you can loosen things up if they're not so bad later on. It did sort of seem so, a little bit slow. There, yeah, yeah, so these idiots you know, <laughs> had thousands of people coming in and out of the country when they didn't know what the situation was. And then a month la- a week later, they decided actually maybe it was pretty bad, so they closed the gate after the horse had bolted. So, I mean, pretty difficult to think how they could do, do it worse. Um, I don't have the level of information or briefings that they have from the Ministry of Health and the World Health Organization, but we know logically mm. that they were either wrong to close the gate at the end of the week um, or they were wrong to leave it open at the start. One way or another, they've failed in basic leadership, and they've failed in communication too because it's difficult to see from David Clark, the Minister of Health, what he was really thinking there. Um, number two, in, in terms of what could it mean, look, it, it does appear, despite them having closed the borders, that... Um, that the lethality and the transmissivity is relatively low, um, that it's probably mainly going to affect, unfortunately for them, people that uh, don't have very good healthcare facilities and infrastructure in other countries. Um, so, you know, I guess that's good for New Zealand, I suppose. Um, but it also has the possibility of being the black swan that finally turns the world economy because this is the longest growth cycle mm. since World War II. The leveraging that's out there fiscally and in terms of loose monetary policy is about as much leveraging as you can get. Um, 
at some point things have to turn and you know, basically stopping the movement of a whole lot of goods and money and services in and out of China, that's in many ways the center of the world economy for a lot of things, um, that, that could be what brings down the house of cards. So we, we could be in a very serious economic um, you know, malaise or we could precipitate a very serious collapse, but I, I, I wouldn't make a prediction of that because people predict these things all the time. I just think it's something we should be mindful of. Yeah. That does scare me. That does worry, like, you know, being self-employed, then you, mm. all of these things, you feel them. Mm. Um, so, hey, looking forward into the election, it does sort of seem like keep an eye on it, and then it may mean that more questions need to be asked of party leaders about what they would do to pivot our economy if mm. that were to happen. Mm. Um, issue four, flooding mm. in Gore. Now, for you listening before, like, for you, all of those you tuned in, um, my question was, where is the flooding? And then we <laughs> ascertained that my geography is terrible. Um, Southland. <laughs> it's near Invercargill. Well, I'm actually going to Gore or scheduled to go to Gore on uh, Wednesday or Thursday for the field days down there. Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I've heard that the roads have not been affected. Um, but, you know, Gore and I may miss out on each other if it gets worse. It's astounding, though, how it's so hot Mm. up this north end of the mm. country. Mm. So we're in Auckland. Um, Hamilton's been having near 30, sometimes 30 degree mm. days, and then mm. we've got that happening down, you know. Well, you sometimes wonder, I mean, it'd be great if we could just average the temperature out everywhere. Yeah. We just average the weather. <laughs> I agree. Uh, everywhere could just be like London. Yeah. <laughs> but without the heaving mass of people, because I did always find that. What's wrong with people? Oh, you know, small doses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a quantity. <laughs> Especially me. Like, you can't, people can't hang around me for too long, you know. It's well, far too. Well, that'd be like the heaving mess of holly. <laughs> <you know. laughs> it's far too intense sometimes. Yeah. No, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and story number five, Act Party Leader State of the Nation Address. So you gave an address today. Um and I have a copy of it here, and I was having, oh a, look, having, having a sort of look, having a look through it. Um, you know, you touched on a lot of uh, going back to some of these things that you hold, like steadfastly, wholeheartedly believe in, which is like freedoms and things like mm. that. It touches on a lot of these core principles mm. that sort of seems like we're gravitating away from them. You know, what do you want to see? What are the the key things that you want to sort of almost pull the country back to? Mm. Um, you've got firearm laws, freedom of speech, all of the you know hate speech laws, all of these mm. kind of things. What are your Look, for, for most of human history, um, people didn't have individual rights. You mm. know, they kind of just went along with whatever the gang imposed on them. Uh, you didn't have rights that were written down that you could defend in a court of law. Yeah. Uh, you know, might was right. Yeah. Um, we have gradually moved to a world where actually the individual has certain rights and they have mechanisms to defend those rights. Yeah. And what that's meant for humanity is that we've unleashed creativity. Mm. So who knew that, you know, the, the nerdy guy um, might, you know, invent the silicon chip, you know, <laughs> instead of just being beaten up all the time. Um, you know, who knew that, um, you know, Kate Shepard was going to become one of the greatest social reformers in the world. Yeah. I mean, you've know, you got to let a thousand flowers bloom because you don't know who the special, or what people are going to have the special achievements. So that basic idea that the individual is sovereign empowerment is so important for a society and so important for the individuals that people get to use the short time they have on earth to you know basically explore the world and make the most of it for themselves so so that's so critical but so often uh you know our policy settings and our politics are driven by very slick marketing mm -hmm. very great gestures that trample the rights of the individual and don't actually achieve the results they want. And, I mean, we talk about firearm freedom of speech. And let me give you a really boring example. Love it. Um, market studies where the Commerce Commission yeah. or the government can basically go and decide to interrogate an entire sector, yeah. make them turn over their information, greater requisition powers than the yeah. police, uh, and try and decide if they're making too much profit or not. Mm -hmm. And the truth about markets 
is that most of what most people are trying to do all the time is work out what the right price should be. They don't know. Yeah. So the idea these idiots from the Commerce Commission can figure it out and then go and say, oh, you're making too much more product, you've got to change your prices. And by the time they do that, it take two years, the conditions all changed anyway. Mm. Uh, it's just completely insane. Mm. But it's this idea that um, you know, the government and the collective can override the rights of a whole lot of individuals and businesses um, you know, doing their own mutually agreed deals. Uh, and, and, and as soon as you do that, it makes us all the poorer. And so I'm just opposed to, you know, I'm opposed to market studies um, because they're not going to give us cheaper petrol, they're going to give us more bureaucracy. I'm opposed to taking away people's firearm rights with no good reason. I'm opposed to suppressing freedom of speech. I'm opposed to forcing people to use their share of education money in a system that's broken. Um, I'm in favour of giving the individual the freedom to choose because that's when you see people flourish and discover better outcomes for themselves but actually for all of us as a country. Going quickly back to that market studies power, mm. if you think about that that as, an co as a concept, um, that's sort of some of the, the feeling that I get around, you know, what I do, which is lobbyists, that people mm. don't really know. Um, what do you think as an industry lobbyists can sort of do to help themselves? So... Get more clients? <laughs> no, 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 not insane. <laughs> no, I mean sort of in bringing more transparency to this industry, you know, uh, mm. quash some of these feelings that it's, you know, there for the elite, mm. uh, you know, that it's only certain sectors uh, yeah. have, have well, access. Well, answer, the answer is in, in entrepreneurship. And, you know, you look at HSB Communications, I mean, your company, like, mm -hmm. I mean, you are doing something quite extraordinary. You are taking... Um, an approach of starting from the the, the average person's perspective, mm. someone who's you know too sane or too busy to be involved in politics, mm. uh, and making politics a, a, a approachable and, and and comprehensible to them. Most lobbyists say, "Oh, I'm I'm an insider. I've got all these connections." Start off understanding the system and then try and connect with the mm -hmm. outsiders. Um, so I think you know what you're doing is great, and it's an example of entrepreneurship solving a problem. So mm. that's that's where I'd start. Um, is, this, is this what you want me to say? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, it's true. I wouldn't Not say. Paid. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't say it if I didn't believe it. Yeah. I think. I think what HSP is doing is really great. Um, and the second thing I'd say to people is that um, you know corruption is bad. Mm. Bribing people is bad. Blackmailing mm. people is bad. Those are all bad things. However, I'd also say that um, you know, lobbyists are invaluable. Mm. I mean, who the hell? is going to go and explain uh, how the electricity market works and what the implications of policy changes might be to a bunch of politicians who know nothing about it. Well, if it's not going to be lobbyists for the electricity companies, then who, who is it going to be? <laughs> you know, the answer better not be the bureaucrats because they probably don't know themselves. So, look, I'm, you know, I'm comfortable with lobbying if it's about informing yes. politicians. I'm less comfortable if it's about you know, bribing and blackmailing, that's more sort of Sicilian. Yeah, I, I agree. No, look, it's just, I think, it's definitely a kupu, a word, that people attach all this emotion to. Yeah. And I think the more, or at least I feel like I'm just here wanting to talk about it yeah. more often. Do, do you know how the term started? Lobbyist? Yeah. No, I have no idea. Well, because, you know, there's, if you look at the, the house where the parliament is, there's there's the seats and everything, yeah. And then there's like a big elongated room to either side, yeah. The, the eyes lobby and the nose lobby, yeah. The lobbyist used to hang out in the lobby and be like, "Hey, I'm gonna vote on that." You know? so <laughs> that's true. They is used, that, to, is they that, used to hang around, yeah. Is that where it comes from? Yeah. I definitely don't do any hanging around lobbies. I tell you <laughs> well, you're, so, you're not allowed to now. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that sometimes people used to sneak in there, yeah. <laughs> hang out in coffers. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the new, you know, maybe they should be called copyists. <laughs> For those of you at home, lobbyists, lo uh, coppers is the cafe. Mm. All right, so. Hey, um, Holly. Yes. Just want to pass a message to you from Robert. He says, um, tell Holly she can take as long as she wants. Um, he's loving this. Take as long? What? Robert, that's very. So Who's Robert? Do you, do you not know Robert? <laughs> no. Okay, the, Robert is Robert Hollis yep. is the reason why we're in the studio. Oh, right. He's the one that sort of 
been the game changer in changing the way uh, a lot of industry views um, engagement and right. talking to people and you oh, know there you go well so so go go Robert <laughs> you know, you, here we go folks a star is born <laughs> well I'm actually I'm still sort of stuck on worried about whether or not you think I'm rude because my head is back there on that comment. <laughs> Wow, so uh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I was just, I was just winding you up. I, was, I don't think you're rude at all. <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot of emotions. Rebecca knows that as well. Yeah, just all, let them all out. Well, not not like them all, not like all at once, obviously, because that sounds <laughs> <laughs> definitely not on the show either. Um, no, that probably wouldn't be good. Um, so we we've ne- like, I know Rebecca, awesome that you're happy for it. Um, David and I to keep yarning. What we should do at some point is get you to. And do you like whiskey? No, I don't drink. Oh, you don't drink? Yeah. Ah, okay. And they, I don't think they make alcohol-free whiskey because there'd be not much left. They do make alcohol-free um, like gin and stuff like it's that. Really it's really weird. That? Yeah, it's so strange because. Um, yeah, so I was I, in the New World just before, and they have this alcohol-free spirit. Yeah. On sale. And it's so weird because I I quit drinking over a year ago. Now, best thing I've ever done, by the way. But um, weirdly. Um, like three different people gave me alcohol-free gin for Christmas this year. But the thing is, I never liked gin when it had alcohol. So why? <laughs> <laughs> so, so if anyone would like some alcohol-free gin, like, I thank so the people that gave it to me. Thank you. But I'm, uh, <laughs> okay, Rebecca, I'm regifting. What we need to do is, so that was me trying to create an opportunity for you two to have a yarn because I do think that um if you when you meet Rebet you'll learn that he just goes blares into things just yep. you know no, no holes barred goes for it and stuff I think you two would get along really well he has an amazing whiskey um collection but because you don't drink you can yeah. have an orange juice together I think because you know he, he'd, he'd do that too you know it's not all about the the whiskey you can have non-alcoholic drinks. No, I think if, you, if whiskey was the only thing you drank, you'd, you know, <laughs> pretty challenging <laughs> on the physiological front. Um, but yeah, you two should definitely have a chat sometime. Um, but we are going to start wrapping this up. So uh, again, what um, we're going to bring it back to the top, which was Simeon left you a note. Right, yes. You have to write yours for next week's guest. Okay, who's next week's guest? To Henare. To Henare. Oh, kia ora, kia ora. <laughs> So, the amazing, the the guy who calls himself an influencer. Oh. <laughs> Note for him, please. Okay, okay. What do you think I should write? Oh, don't ask a lobbyist. <laughs> and as you're doing that, yep. um, the other thing that I always get guests to do, mm. always, so... Last week, this week, next week, continuing on, um, is to have a look at these, which are a quintessential part of Kiwi confectionery, which is fruit bursts, and choose the colour so I can start making a tally of what is the most popular flavour because it's quite contentious and I've had this conversation a number of times where people utterly reject certain flavours and then find favourites. So I'm interested to know what our politicians, people who are interested in politics like myself, which flavour is their favourite. And last week I said to Simeon, you can't, there's not really any blue. There's no blue one apart from the blue on the edge. There is a yellow one. There's two yellow ones. Yeah. There's no. a yellow too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just in general. You, you mm. know. Mm. Yellow the is one of the fruit burst colours. I don't like bananas though. Yeah, see. So, uh, I think, you know. Oh, I need the pen back. Sorry. Oh, do you? Yeah. 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 Um, so remember, he'll say that on air. Mm. So. Oh, oh, oh you're actually going to read it out on air? Just like you did. Oh, okay. Sorry. One second. <laughs> Kidding, 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 it's okay. <laughs> oh my god, I was about to be like, hey, well, let's read it now. <laughs> um, draw a line in the sand. Which flavour would you go for? Which fruit burst mm. do you like? Well, you know, sugar is um, really not a healthy thing to eat, and I think. Um, so, no alcohol, <laughs> no sugar. Yeah. 
all freedom. I'm running Come out. On. I'm running out. I'm running out of things to give up. Actually. Um, look, um, I'd, I'd probably go with the wild berry. Actually, yeah. like I mean, I like the yellow, and that's X color. But but also, um, we recently introduced the color magenta. So see, I even got my magenta tie uh, here. Yeah. Yeah, but the problem is like it's not magenta. Yeah. Um, and so like my my staff just have so little faith in me in sartorial matters and they, they think <laughs> I'm, I'm an idiot in the clothing, <laughs> the clothing department. Um, so I went and bought this thing and, I mean, you can probably see and, um, you know, they said, you know that's You know that watermelon. everyone, all they can see is you opening your well, coat to me and me, yeah, like, yeah. staring at you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm just showing you my tie. <laughs> just uh, FYI, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so, but what I mean, it, it, it never works because the camera makes it look, look distorts the color anyway. Yeah. But um, it, it turns out I, I bought watermelon. Oh. Yeah. What what did oh, what did Brooke say about that? She would have been. Oh well, like I say, they they have a low opinion of me on sartorial matters. But um, do I get to eat this? Well, you can if you'd like. Okay. Just means that you'll have no out- outgoing statement, I suppose, as you I, chew I'll, away. I'll save it for later because I'm, I'm a fiscal conservative. <laughs> so, yeah. It's been That's so capital formation <laughs> right there. <laughs> it's been so awesome to have you on our show. It's been really fun to have you on it. What a great initiative! Thank you. I hope lots of people watch it. Yeah. Well, well we're just slowly building up the numbers. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're, if you start getting better guests, I mean that. Can, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got it. I'm not gonna lie. Like, I was very excited to have you on today. You should As get you... Paula Bennett on. I think she'd, she'd be, be fun. Fantastic. You two would be a lot of fun. Yeah, but it'd be noisy, and Lorchner would probably become deaf. Yeah, but he could turn it down. <laughs> or get, he he get, might just leave, and he then could we get, have... <laughs> he could get those noise cancelling headphones. <laughs> I'm already deaf right now. <laughs> what? Well, how do you, how do you know what we're talking about? What? Too slow. <laughs> um, it's been awesome to yeah, have, it's been fun. have you here. And please come back anytime you like, or um, if you'd love to send Brooke along or Beth, any of your candidates. You should really talk to Brooke and Beth. Yeah, it yeah. would just be fantastic. Yeah, should we, should we, should we tee up Brooke? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But we ha- her and okay, if we get Brooke on the show, her and I need to catch up prior to coming on the show. Right. Because obviously, Brooke. I have a lot of time for her, yeah, yeah. so we need to have a little bit of a gossip session, I think, first before we. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's a free. It's a free country. You know, you live how you want to live. Like, I, I, you know, I, I don't know why you're running this by me. I mean, <laughs> no, more just for we'll probably end up into anarchy, ending up in conversations everywhere. And, yeah. You know. Okay. Well, I mean, she could be watching. I don't know. Yeah. Well, so maybe she. Brooke, if you are, yeah, you're coming on the show. We're going to get you in. All here. right, yeah. And Brooke, you, you've got full permission to have a, a catch up and gossip with Holly beforehand, <laughs> which I didn't think you needed. But yeah. um, and best of luck for the election campaign. Yeah, thank this you. Year. It's going to be um, a wild ride, I think. And Holy. look, hey, as as clear from what is National's announcement, you know. Clearly, you're the party that they would go with. You know, they've yeah. said that they're not going to go with anyone else. So that's what I read in the press release. So well, they they you know, they, 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 they need someone else who's in parliament, and um, yeah. so that that leaves Act in a, a very useful position. Act would never go with Labour and the Greens. Oh, look! If we could time travel to the '80s when Labour was sensible, um, <laughs> that's a possibility. But no, look. I mean, you look at where they are now. Um, it's difficult to imagine how you could work with them because, you know, the, the, their, their basic approach to just about anything economic is mm. so destructive mm. that we just couldn't really make it work. Mm. Um, so good luck. Thank you. I'm sure I will see you again on the campaign trail Hope at so. some point. Um, and for everyone at let's watching at home, that wraps up this episode of the Political Power Hour. Um, if you want to get in touch with David, he's on all social media. That's right. Pretty, yeah, I'm like the most promiscuous person in that regard. <laughs> like, you know, like I'm, on, I'm, on, I'm on WeChat so the CCP can monitor me. Um, you know, I'm, on, I'm on Snapchat so, you know, people are too young to are vote. Are you on Snapchat? Of course. I'm on Snapchat. Are you? We should okay, snap yeah. <laughs> each other maybe. I don't know. Like you should, I, th- this show is on my Snapchat story right now. So it's, yes. a great, it's a great tool for reaching a lot David, of people. David, are you on TikTok? On TikTok. TikTok. Oh, wow. sorry. Uh, sorry, no, TikTok's not that one. That's oh. another. 
was, a different one. I was like Grinder or something. I know. Oh my god! Um, no, 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 I'm not on that. Um, I think you should be because yeah, you know I think TikTok though it just sort of sounds a bit too young. But I don't know. We'll try it. A bit too young. We'll think about it. Yeah, I guess I am on Snapchat, so I don't really have any standards. You'd be the first to be yeah. on TikTok. The first. Android yeah, that's what I'm worried about. Um, so. <laughs> And then I, I'm on LinkedIn for like, you know, people that have jobs or want to get jobs. Yeah, like LinkedIn. You're in LinkedIn. You're a LinkedIn, LinkedIn dynamo. Um, <laughs> and then what else am I on? On Facebook because you've just got to be I'm on yeah. Instagram. Yeah. I'm on Twitter, but I never look at it because it's all just a cesspit of horrible people. Um, we're, we're, okay, Political Power Hour is on Twitter. Yeah. I don't really like it that much. No. It's a lot of people being a lot angry about a lot of things. There's no, there's no normal people on Twitter. It's it's quite like destructive almost, you know. Oh, it is. It is. I, I would not recommend going on. <laughs> I just think, and it's interesting. You talk to people in the in the mainstream media, say, well, you know, are you getting any traffic off Twitter? Mm. And they're not. I mean, normal people are not on there. Yeah, <laughs> normal people. Yeah, I'm pretty abnormal, so I'm just, yeah. There we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so people feel free to reach out to you, get in touch. If they're in the Epsom yeah. electorate, they can drop into your electorate office. They sure can. 27 Gillies have open, you know, about roughly nine, to, usually longer, but at least nine to five, uh, Monday to Friday. Five two two seven four six four. Get in touch if you live in the Epsom electorate and uh, we'll try and help you out. Also, mpepsom at parliament.govt.nz. You know, if people are like serious stuff, it's actually better to email either, you know, mpepsom at at parliament.govt.nz or david.seymour at parliament.govt. Um, because, you know, then you can sort of have a conversation. Um, but if you want to send me a message on Instagram, well, that's just slide in the DMs. That's fine too. Slide in the DMs! I tell you, I, I learned that from some young people. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The ACT Party leader said, slide in the DMs. We're going to leave it there. I'm a bit folks. worried it might mean more than I thought. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, yeah, okay. I was going to say that. About, no, we're just going to keep it moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, that's today's episode, everyone. So join us again next week, 3.30 till 4.30, when we've got To Henari on, where he'll be opening your note. Oh, shit. <laughs> Live on air. <laughs> <laughs> and um, hey, if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure that you leave a comment, leave a like. And absolutely, if you have more questions for David or you want to get in touch, mm. remember he is the ACT Party leader. Mm. Um, so he is there shaping policy and where he wants his party to head. Um, feel free to get in touch with him. Thank you so much for watching and have an amazing rest of your Waitangi day. Kakite. Kakite. Okay.